This week at Starbase, another tank meets its demise at the Orbital Tank Farm, glass installation begins on the Star Factory building's feature facade, and Booster 13 heads to the Massey Outpost to begin its testing campaign while work continues on the new Flame Trench. Meanwhile, over at Cape Canaveral, SpaceX reaches a new milestone with its 300th successful landing of a Falcon 9 booster as launch and recovery operations continue full steam ahead. Now let's dig into this week's SpaceX update. Starting off this week in the early hours of Friday morning, crews were spotted going up in lifts to inspect the lifting eyes on top of one of the cryotank shells. Originally designed for methane storage, this tank was instead repurposed as a water tank. About an hour later, the LR-11000 lifted the cryo tank load spreader and crews attached it to the shell. Since this tank was turned into a water tank before ever being used for methane, the space between the tank and the shell was never insulated, making scrapping slightly easier. After the Friday sun rose into the Texas sky, crews were seen dismantling the construction elevator on the outside of Mega Bay 2. This likely indicates that the internal elevators are now operational and that this initial phase of the building's construction is finally wrapping up. Back down at the orbital tank farm, crews began cutting into the water tank's cryo shell. While the lack of insulation made this scrapping simpler, the addition of the steel exoskeleton on the shell's side added a little extra complication. Here we can see dump trucks shifting dirt around over near Pad B. This dirt is being used to begin groundwork on the remaining small spit of land between the former parking lot and the extension past Pad B. By mid-afternoon, the first round of cutting on the cryo shell was complete. Given the additional weight of the exoskeleton, the shell was cut lopsided to keep it balanced during the liftoff of the tank underneath. Once free, the shell was moved over to the scrapping area along Highway 4. On Saturday morning, two truckloads of glass for the front corner of the Star Factory building arrived at the build site. That afternoon, workers began installing the first pieces of glass onto the feature corner of the massive rocket factory. Once the first small triangular piece was in place, the crews worked quickly, lifting several additional pieces in over the next few hours. Back at the launch site, crews were making quick work of the first large section of the cryo shell. By late afternoon, the shell fragment had been reduced to smaller, more manageable pieces to be sent off as scrap. In the early hours of Sunday morning, crews began cutting off a large section of the shell remnant that was left behind during the initial lift. A few hours later, another couple of truckloads of glass arrived at the build site. Once the sun was up, crews got back to work installing the windows onto the front corner of the Star Factory. Before dawn on Monday, the next large piece of the cryo shell was finally cut free and lifted away before being lowered to the roadside scrapping area. Over the next few hours, crews worked to cut the section into smaller pieces. As the day shift started on Monday, the Star Factory glass crew was right back at it as this building's feature facade starts to look more impressive by the day. Down at the launch site, a perlite vacuum truck was spotted pulling into the tank farm. This truck was there to begin removing the insulation from the next cryo shell to prepare it to be scrapped next. A few hours later, the LR-11000, now equipped with a 9-meter tank load spreader, was connected to the top of the recently exposed methane tank turned water tank. That afternoon, up Highway 4 at the Massey Outpost, a large platform was lifted over the flame trench. This platform will go directly underneath the stand, providing a solid work surface under it. During the static fire testing, the platform will be retracted out of the way. Around 1 o'clock on Tuesday morning, the LR-11000 crane lifted the water tank off of its concrete pedestal and rotated it over to the scrapping area. Crews then got to work quickly cutting the bottom section off of the tank. Throughout the rest of the morning and into the afternoon, the process continued with the tank shrinking as its sections were repeatedly cut free. By mid-afternoon, the crane was detached from the final section, allowing it to be cut up into smaller pieces. A little later, a new expansion loop for the liquid oxygen supply piping was brought to the tank farm and lifted into place. This prefabricated U-shaped section of piping provides a more flexible joint in the middle of the long runs of piping, mitigating any potential failure due to the expansion and contraction of the piping during extreme temperature changes. 
That evening, over at the Massey Outpost, the first of the prefabricated sections of the flame bucket was lifted by a crane and lowered into the flame trench. In the early hours of Wednesday morning, the booster thrust simulator arrived at the build site. After turning in the main gate, it was parked in front of High Bay while Booster 13 was prepared for transport. About an hour and a half later, the new booster cap was brought into the ring yard from between High Bay and Mega Bay 1 and set down outside the booster bay. This ring is speculated to simply be a hat for boosters to wear outside to protect the elements on the top of the rocket when no hot staging ring has been installed. After dawn, the cap was taken inside of the bay. About an hour later, Booster 11's hot staging ring was spotted moving across the ring yard. The article was then parked in the staging area in front of Mega Bay 1 to await installation atop Flight 4 Super Heavy. Around that same time, over at Massey's outpost, the second piece of the flame bucket followed the previous section into the trench. Later that morning at the launch site, crews began setting up the wick drain stitcher once again. This time, it'll be installing the wick drains in the final spit of land that's being prepared for the next launch tower. Back up Highway 4 at the office construction site, crews began installing steel for the upper level of the building. The previous phase of steel work installed the steel up to the base of the fourth floor, and now construction is moving on to the fifth floor and roof steel. Looking past the office building into Mega Bay 1, the facility's two bridge cranes combined to pick up the tandem booster load spreader, which was then connected to the top of booster 13. About an hour later, the booster thrust simulator was moved into Mega Bay 1 as SpaceX prepared to shift Booster 13 off the production stand and onto the test stand for its trip to Massey's. That evening, with SpaceX working to make the chopsticks catch ready, the chopsticks were seen undergoing a fresh round of testing. While the catch attempt won't occur on Flight 4, it seems possible that SpaceX might try to perform a catch simulation with the arms during this launch. Just after 7, the detonation suppression systems were tested on the orbital launch mount. Over the next half hour or so, the system was tested several more times as SpaceX works to prepare for Flight 4. Once the detonation suppression testing was completed, the chopsticks were then opened and lowered down to the base of the tower. That night, Booster 13 was lifted in Mega Bay 1 and transferred onto the awaiting thrust simulator stand. Then, just before midnight, the booster was secured to the stand and detached from the load spreader. Then, as the calendar flipped over to Thursday, the rollout began. Booster 13 left Mega Bay 1 and turned right onto Highway 4, heading for the Massey Outpost, where it will undergo its initial round of cryogenic proof testing and puck shucking before heading back to Mega Bay 1 for engines. As Booster 13 was rolling towards the Massey Outpost, back in Mega Bay 1, work was continuing on Booster 14. One of the rocket pressurization pipes was lifted and installed onto its liquid oxygen tank. A bit after 3 o'clock on Thursday morning, Booster 13 completed its journey arriving at Massey's to be readied for its upcoming test campaign. About an hour later, back at the build site, a second pressurization pipe followed the first and was installed onto Booster 14's liquid oxygen tank. Then a short time later, Booster 14's methane tank was lifted off the turntable and transferred onto a waiting stand. After dawn, crews were back at work on the office building with the installation of the steel for the structure's upper levels pushing forward. That afternoon, Rovercam checked in on the progress of the new parking garage. We can see that the building's construction is finally moving into the above ground phase and the precast concrete beams and columns are being installed. Over at the Star Factory building, significant progress has been made on the glass installation on the building's corner facade. Crews had nearly completed the bottom row of windows and moving up began installing several of the panes in the row above. Late that afternoon, the chopsticks underwent another fresh round of testing. They were raised slightly up the tower before the left arm was put through some actuation tests. To wrap up this latest round of Mechazilla testing, the ship lifting pins were deployed and retracted three times in less than eight minutes. Switching over to Florida, on Friday afternoon, Bob returned to Port Canaveral with both of the fairing halves from the Starlink Group 6-51 launch. 
About eight and a half hours later, Just Read the Instructions was towed back into port with Falcon Booster 1077 from the same mission. Shortly after the drone ship was tied to the Port Canaveral dock, the crane was then connected to the rocket and lifted onto the dock side for processing ahead of its return to Roberts Road. Then, less than nine hours after its return to port, just read the instructions once again was towed back off the dock and out to sea in support of its next mission. That evening, Bob also headed back out to sea, having spent about 25 hours in port before his departure for the Starlink Group 6-53 launch. By Sunday morning, dockside processing was wrapped up for Booster 1077. It was then lifted off the stand and placed onto the horizontal transporter for its trip back to SpaceX refurbishment facilities. That afternoon, Doug returned to port with a fairing has from the Starlink Group 6-52 launch and towing a short follow Gravitas with Booster 1080 from the same mission. Then, within just a few hours, the Falcon 9 booster was lifted off of the drone ship and transferred to the dockside stand for processing. Early on Tuesday evening, Falcon 9 Booster 1078 launched its ninth mission, launching Starlink Group 6-53 from Space Launch Complex 40. On Wednesday morning, Booster 1080 was lifted off of its dockside stand and laid onto an awaiting SPMT for its return trip to Hangar X at Roberts Road. And just after mid-morning on Thursday, the transporter erector at Historic Launch Complex 39A was laid down for rollback to the Horizontal Integration Facility to pick up the next rocket on the pad's manifest. Early that evening, just read the instructions returned to port for the second time this week. This time, it was carrying Booster 1078 from the Starlink Group 6-53 mission, marking SpaceX's 300th successful landing of a Falcon 9 booster. Once again, as usual, crews wasted no time. The rocket was offloaded from the drone ship within just a few hours and placed onto the dockside stand for processing. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.